minute or so. I want to welcome everyone to the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences 2022 Marston La France Lecture with Dr. Sarah Castile. And it's wonderful to see so many of you out here today towards the end of term. Uh, my name is Carol Payne. I'm Associate Dean Research and International at FAS. I want to remind you that the session today is being recorded, so others who weren't able to come this afternoon can enjoy Sarah's lecture. Um, we are going to be having a discussion afterwards with questions. I'm going to ask that you please use the chat function to let me know if you have a question and I'll call on you. Um, and I will also remind people to be muted. I think that's done automatically, but in case it isn't, if you don't mind being muted during the lecture, but not for the questions. And I'll begin also uh, by acknowledging that Carleton University, where I sit, where many of you sit, um, and this area are on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. And this acknowledgement also acknowledges Carleton's responsibility to the Algonquin people and a responsibility to adhere to Algonquin cultural protocols. And with that, I want to uh, turn over things to Dean Pauline Rankin of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences to introduce our speaker, Sarah Castile. Pauline? Thanks, Carol, and welcome everyone. Uh, it's great pleasure to be able to introduce our 2022 Marston La France lecturer. Uh, I feel that there's a certain inevitability to this talk today. Sarah has had an exceptional research career from the moment she got her first appointment here. And so uh, today's talk seems like the culmination of a, a really remarkable research career. Uh, Sarah Phillips Castile is a professor in the Department of English and is cross-appointed to both the Institute for Comparative Studies in Literature, Art, and Culture and the Institute of African Studies. Sarah co-founded the Center for Transnational Cultural Analysis and Migration and Diaspora Studies Research Initiative here at Carleton. But beyond Carleton, she has taught as a visiting professor at the University of Vienna in Austria and the University of Potsdam in Germany, where she held the Potsdam Postcolonial Chair in global modernities in 2021. Sarah's research is situated at the intersection of Black studies and Jewish studies. By developing innovative transnational and comparative methodologies, she seeks to illuminate the mutual entanglements of diaspora cultures. Her monograph, Calypso Jews, Jewishness in the Caribbean Literary Imagination in 2016, broadened discussion of Black Jewish relations beyond the US national frame by examining Caribbean writers' invocations of the Sephardic expulsion and the Holocaust. To further advance emerging conversations between post-colonial studies and Jewish studies, Sarah co-edited Caribbean Jewish Crossings, Literary History and Creative Practice in 2019. Sarah's earlier publications include her monograph, Second Arrivals, Landscape and Belonging in the Contemporary Writing of the Americas in 2007, and her co-edited volume, Canada and Its Americas, Transnational Navigations in 2010. Sarah is the, the recipient of a Polanyi Prize from the Government of Ontario, a Horst Friends Prize from the American Comparative Literary Association, a Canadian Jewish Literary Award, a Carleton University Research Achievement Award, and two FAST Research Awards. She was a visiting fellow at Berlin's Jewish Studies Center in 2019, and she is currently the 2122 Norman Rabb Foundation Fellow at the Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. The title of her talk today is drawn from her current Shirk funded project, Making History Visible, Black Lives Under Nazism in Literature and Art. And the virtual stage is yours, Sarah. And thanks so much for delivering this lecture today. Thank you so much, Pauline, uh, for that really generous introduction. I'll just get my slides up. And can everyone see that okay? Uh, my computer's making alarming fan noises, but I hope you can hear me all right. 
Um, thank you all so much for being here. And, and thanks again, Pauline. Uh, I'm so grateful to, to FAST, to the English department and to ICSLAC for giving me the opportunity to complete my book manuscript this year. I also want to acknowledge the support of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and a number of other institutions and individuals uh, too numerous to name in the Caribbean, the US, Holland, Belgium, Germany, England, and Scotland that have helped me to trace little known black wartime stories, uh, some of which I'll share with you today. Above all, I'm indebted to the descendants of Caribbean painter Joseph Massey and his fellow artist, the Polish Jew Max Brandel, who were imprisoned together in a Nazi internment camp in Bavaria during World War II. I come to this project as an outsider to Black culture. At the same time, my relationship to the research is informed by my own Eastern European Jewish family's history of persecution during the Holocaust. Accordingly, I've drawn inspiration from Nazis and other artists' relational perspective on the interconnected histories of Black and Jewish suffering under the Nazis. I argue that this relational perspective significantly reorients our understanding of the Holocaust and its artistic representation by revealing the interconnectedness of colonial and Holocaust histories. In August 2021, Holocaust memorial stones were installed on the Max Bellstrasse and Torstrasse in Berlin. They joined the more than 75,000 other Stolpersteine or stumbling stones that have been laid since the mid 1990s in Germany and across Europe in front of former residences of victims of the Third Reich. These two stones were distinctive, however, in commemorating individuals of African descent. Martha Ndumbe, who was of Cameroonian and German or heritage uh, and perished at Ravensbrück in 1945, and Ferdinand James Allen, who was of Caribbean and German heritage and was killed at the Berenberg Psychiatric Hospital in 1941. Their installation brought the number of Stolpersteine dedicated to Black victims to a total of four. The first such stone, also located in Berlin's Mitte district, was installed in 2007 in memory of Majub bin Adam Mohammed, a colonial soldier and film actor from Dar es Salaam who perished in Sachsenhausen in 1944. The second was laid in 2009 in Frankfurt to commemorate Hagar Mar Martin Brown, a South African who died in 1940 as a result of Nazi medical experiments. Along with other recent memorialization projects, such as France's call to rename French streets after African and Caribbean allied soldiers, the dedication of these four Stolpersteine marked the, the emergence of a public recognition of Black people as being among both Hitler's victims and Europe's liberators. Long before the installation of these memorial stones, however, Black victims of Nazi persecution had documented their experiences in their wartime artwork and post-war testimonies. Moreover, starting in the late 1980s, a number of African diaspora writers and artists who had not themselves experienced the Nazi regime began to imaginatively recover these victim stories through the mnemonic mediums of literature and vis visual art. While the appearance of many of these post-memorial artworks coincided with the Holocaust memory boom of the late 20th century, for the most part, they did not gain much traction. Instead, they anticipated a shift in memory culture that is only now underway, catalyzed in the public sphere by Black European activism and the Black Lives Matter movement, and in academia by the growth of Black European studies and by the colonial turn in Holocaust studies. Probing the boundaries of Holocaust art and memory, my book project draws attention to a largely unrecognized corpus of literature and visual art that addresses Black experience in wartime Europe. This corpus and its often ambivalent reception reveal how entrenched categories of art and victimhood can obstruct our access to the past and obscure connections among histories, identities, and aesthetic traditions that conventionally have been perceived as separate. While this body of art recovers a neglected past, my interest as a cultural critic lies less in securing historical facts than in understanding how artworks produce, reshape, and circulate memory. In line with a cultural memory studies approach, I consider the role of art in the formation of collective memory 
and how art's aesthetic qualities contribute to its mnemonic force. My corpus illustrates that art operates not only as a vehicle, but also as an agent of memory, Challenge, challenging the systematic erasure of Black wartime histories and perspectives the artworks I examine serve as a counterweight to hegemonic narratives of the past. At the heart of this project then is the relationship between art, memory, and resistance. Unlike Jews and Roma and Sinti, people of African descent were not systematically targeted by the Nazis for elimination. Nonetheless, they su uh, suffered a variety of forms of persecution during the Nazi period including ostracization, forced sterilization, incarceration in labor, internment and concentration camps, medical experimentation and death. As the biographies of the four victims of African descent commemorated by Stolpersteiner attest, this small population was heterogeneous. It included black Europeans, many of whom were of dual African and European heritage, African Caribbean and African American expatriates who traveled to Europe in search of educational and employment opportunities, and colonial and African American troops. Among the African American emigres were a number of jazz musicians, such as Freddie Johnson, who chose to stay in Europe when the war broke out rather than return to the segregated American society they had sought to escape. Others who fell victim to the Nazi regime included POWs, such as the Senegalese writer and statesman Leopold Sedar Senghor, members of the resistance, such as the Surinamese anti-colonial thinker Anton de Combe and the Congolese Dachau prisoner Jean Vosté, uh, who you see pictured here on the slide, and children of former German colonial subjects, such as the Black German memoirist Theodor Michael. The experiences of this victim group remain a largely untold chapter in the history of the Third Reich. The central problem confronted by the writers and artists I discuss is the invisibility of these Black European wartime experiences. This invisibility does not simply bespeak a casual or passive disregard for Black history. Rather, it needs to be understood as an active and systematic practice of disavowal. A particularly vivid illustration of this practice was the deliberate removal of Black colonial soldiers from the unit that liberated Paris in August 1944. When, while two thirds of the free French forces were Black, the Allied High Command insisted that Paris must be seen to be liberated by white soldiers. As this example of the visual excision of Black colonial soldiers from the European theater of war attests, History is not simply a fixed reality. Instead, as the Haitian scholar Michel Rotrio emphasizes, history is both a social process and a narrative of the past that expresses our relationship to historical knowledge. Accordingly, every historical narrative is attended by a particular bundle of silences, as Trouillot put it, silences that reflect the relations of power and present conditions in which that narrative is produced. Notably inherent in the processual and unfixed character of historical knowledge is the potential for the emergence of new counter hegemonic narratives of the past that is the primary focus of my study. In silencing the past, Trouillot takes issue with theories of history for failing to recognize the extent to which historical knowledge is produced in sites situated outside of academia. A case in point is the artistic corpus I have assembled for my project, which actively and creatively intervenes into the collective memory of World War II and the Holocaust. In her book, Other Germans, Tina Kampt offers an illuminating analysis of Black German oral histories as memory technologies that transform memory into public texts as accessible to interpretation, while also quote, functioning as a mode of articulation and construction of identity, experience, events, and history, unquote. In my study, I argue that alongside the compelling Black German oral histories discussed by Tina Kempt, literature and art are key mnemonic technologies, so that in the words of Ghanaian-Canadian writer Essie Dujan, art too is the defense against erasure. Moreover, as counter-memorial agents, artistic mediums offer particular advantages. As memory studies scholars have shown, because of their poetic license and aesthetic qualities, literary genres and other art forms 
often have greater staying power than other modes of remembrance. This capacity of art to store and circulate knowledge of the past and to make that knowledge stick becomes still more pronounced in the context of invisibilized histories. In such a context, artworks do not simply act as relay stations or stabilizers of memory, to use Anne Rigney's terminology, but can also serve as catalysts for the emergence of new or neglected memories. In the case of my corpus, they do so by producing unfamiliar images of World War II and the Holocaust, in which European and African diaspora histories are deeply entangled with one another. I'd like to now offer you several uh, key examples that demonstrate the counter memorial function of art in the context of Black wartime history. I'll begin with testimonial art produced during the war and then turn to post memorial works that imaginatively reconstruct wartime experience. Exercising the particular affordances of their respective mediums, painting, fiction, and photo montage. Each work illustrates the role of the artist as a producer of historical knowledge. Yet I'll argue that ultimately, these artworks are less invested in documenting or recovering historical facts than they are in exposing the relations of power that have contributed to the invisibility of these facts. Okay, so this is my uh, first of, of three examples. Buried in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's storage facility in suburban Washington are a series of drawings and paintings by Joseph Nassi, a little known Caribbean artist of African and Sephardic Jewish descent. From 1942 to 1945, Nassi was interned in Nazi Germany alongside a number of other black prisoners. During his imprisonment, he created a poignant and extensive visual diary that constitutes a unique visual document of black civilian internment. With its encoded and compressed character, Nazi's internment art records black wartime perspectives that remain unarticulated in textual records of the camps. Nazi's biography exhibits a pattern of emancipatory emigration and self reinvention that also characterizes many of the other figures of African descent addressed in my study. After spending his early years in the Dutch Caribbean colony of Suriname, where he was born in 1904, Nazi moved in 1918 to New York City, where he attended high school and earned a degree in electrical engineering. Much like a number of African Americans during the interwar years, Nasi eventually sought greater freedom and prospects through emigration to Europe. The opportunity came in 1929 when he was sent to England to install sound systems for the first talking movies. Nasi subsequently settled in Brussels where he married a Belgian woman and studied painting at the Académie des Beaux-Arts. Paradoxically, Nasi's emancipatory migration to Europe exposed him to a different regime of racial oppression that took hold with the rise of the Third Reich. Following the German occupation of Belgium and the entry of the United States into the war, Nasi was arrested as an enemy alien in April 1942. After being held in a transit camp in Belgium, he was transferred for the duration of the war to two uh, civilian POW camps, Elog 7 in Laufen, Bavaria, and its subcamp in the neighboring village of Titmoning. Uh, Elog uh, meaning Internierungslager uh, or internment camp. During his internment, thanks to the Geneva Convention and the International YMCA, Nasi received art supplies that enabled him to produce over 200 drawings and paintings. Comprising interior and exterior scenes, as well as portraits in pencil, ink, and oil paint, the work's muted palette, bleak imagery, and stark composition convey the loneliness, anxiety, and deprivations of daily life in Nazi civilian POW camps. The psychological challenges of internment find their deepest expression in Nazis' moving portraits of his fellow prisoners. In keeping with other art created in the Nazi camp system, the genre that dominates the collection is portraiture. Somewhat atypically uh, for internment portraiture, however, Nasi does not include any textual information identifying his subjects. Nasi's portraits are all also unusual in that many of them portray black internees, 
16 of whom were imprisoned alongside him in ELOG 7. While most were African-American musicians and inter entertainers, one was a West African who had been in the British Navy. In one of his most complex oil compositions, Nasi portrays nine of the black prisoners in their cramped barracks in Titmoning Castle in 1943. Here, the thick application of paint and gray and brown tones generate an atmosphere of airless enclosure. In the background, one prisoner faces away from the viewer at a silent piano, while four others sit or lie in their bunks. In the foreground, three seated figures are occupied while preparing, uh, sorry, with preparing or eating food and playing the guitar. Meanwhile, a fourth stares out at the viewer, his raised eyebrows and direct gaze inviting us to engage with and witness the scene. Head tilted to one side, right hand resting on his knee, shoulders slumped and legs splayed, he appears resigned to his fate, his passive pose conveying the despair and helplessness of his situation. In the upper left-hand corner of the canvas, we see Nasi himself at work at an easel while perched on his bunk. This embedded self-portrait signals how, as an imprisoned artist, Nasi reclaimed some degree of agency and control by organizing the visual elements that make up this scene of disempowerment. Nasi's portrait of the Black Titmoning internees communicates in a concentrated fashion possible only through a visual medium, the prisoner's psychological and material predicament. The composition suggests the emotional and political relationships forged among the prisoners by the racialized conditions of their internment, which included being bunked together in a confined space. Notably, however, each of the prisoners appears lost in his own thoughts. The men do not converse and their gazes are directed away from one another. Thus, while their spatial assembly can be read as an affirmation of group solidarity, Nasi maintains a sense of their individuality while hinting at possible fragmentation. In keeping with the genre of civic group portraiture, Nasi's composition seeks to balance the simultaneous expression of group solidarity, equality, and individuality. A double portrait that Nasi painted the following year likely depicts the African-American jazz musicians, Johnny Mitchell and Henry Crowder. As in the group portrait, here Nasi presents the two prisoners in the austere claustrophobic atmosphere of the medieval castle that served as their barracks. In contrast to the stiff, motionless posture characteristic of individual portraits, the men's more casual poses convey their enforced intimacy and shared identity as prisoners. Mitchell is seated on the top bunk of a bed playing the guitar, while Crowder lies on the bunk below reading, his head propped up in his left hand. Intent on their activities, the prisoner's knitted brows and heavily shadowed faces convey the psychological challenges of internment. Nasi's internment art illustrates the capacity of visual media to document a hyper-visible prisoner population that nonetheless has remained hidden from view in the collective memory of World War II. Recording the particular conditions of Black civilian internment, the Nasi collection at the same time promotes a relational understanding by positioning the Black prisoners' experiences as intimately connected to those of other victim groups it depicts including a number of Polish Jewish refugees, uh, prisoners, I should say. Moreover, by virtue of Nazi's Caribbean origins and the colonial backgrounds of some of the other internees he portrayed, the collection reveals the interpenetration of European and colonial wartime experiences. Another rare visual uh, record of the black presence in ELOG 7 are several photographs also in the USHMM collection. Taken by an unknown photographer, images of the jazz pianist Freddie Johnson and guitarist Johnny Mitchell performing while imprisoned in Titmoning in 1943 or 44 give little indication of the camp setting or its psychological challenges. In one photograph, Johnson plays the piano in the foreground while Mitchell accompanies him on the guitar. Here Johnson is animated, his mouth open in a wide grin, his hand hovering in midair above the keys, his eyes engaging an audience situated beyond the picture's frame. By contrast, Nasi's four drawings of Johnson show an unsmiling, pensive figure gazing down at the music, his furrowed brow suggesting preoccupation or worry. 
Nasi's portraits of the black prisoners of Ulog 7 also contrast with cartoons and caricatures created in the camp. While caricature had significant value uh, in the context of internment as a satirical mode that could evade censors and convey sharp critique, it draws on a racialized register of imagery characteristic of the period that is not adapted to conveying the psychological complexity communicated by Nasi's paintings and drawings. Juxtaposed with other examples of the visual culture of the internment camps, including photography and caricature, Nasi's art reveals the varying capacity of different modes of visual representation to preserve the memory of a marginalized prisoner population. Okay, I'm gonna to turn now to the second set of examples. In the 1990s and early 2000s, black wartime stories such as that of Joseph Nasi helped to inspire a number of works of fiction by African diaspora writers who had not themselves directly experienced Nazi persecution. The plots of these novels hinge on the discovery of a fictionalized testimonial object that provides an opening to memory. By exhibiting the testimonial object for the reader, the novels compensate for gaps in the archive of World War II, much as slavery fiction supplies voices of the enslaved that are missing from the colonial archive. So turning now from image to text and from testimonial art to post-war imaginative reconstruction, I'd like to briefly discuss two works of jazz fiction, African-American writer John A. Williams's 1999 novel, Clifford's Blues, uh, and a work that may be more uh, familiar to Canadian audiences, Essia Dugin's 2011 novel, Half-Blood Blues. Combining Holocaust fiction's documentary effect with jazz fiction's polyvocality, these novels excavate the forgotten stories of expatriate Black musicians, such as Arthur Briggs and Valeda Snow, uh, both pictured on the slide, who were working in Europe when the war broke out and who faced the dilemma of whether to remain on the continent or return to difficult conditions at home. In so doing, the novels illustrate the capacity of jazz fiction to produce revisionary wartime narratives. In Clifford's Blues, the classic blues narrative of an uprooted suffering individual navigating an alien world is transposed to an unexpected setting, the Dachau concentration camp. Williams's novel centers on a gay African-American jazz pianist named Clifford, who is arrested by the Gestapo in Berlin in 1933 after being discovered with a male lover. In Dachau, Clifford struggles not only to survive, but to have his existence recognized. After Clifford is arrested, his hopes of being released are dashed when he is told that, quote, it looks like I don't exist. They say the embassy claims it has no record of me. Acutely conscious of such erasures, Williams' central concern in the novel is the recovery, preservation, and circulation of memory. The novel opens with a dedication to those without memorial or monument, thereby positioning itself as a literary memorial to forgotten Black victims of Nazi persecution. Clifford's Blues consists of a series of dated diary entries spanning May 1933 to April 1945 with no chapter divisions or other overtly novelistic devices other than an epigraph and two letters that bookend the, uh, the diary. The reader becomes the recipient of this fictionalized testimony, which Clifford composes during his incarceration to console himself and to document the atrocities to which he bears witness. Clifford's clandestine diary imaginatively records the unwritten history of black victims of the Third Reich against the background of the establishment of the Nazi racial state and of the camp system. Like other works of Holocaust fiction, Clifford's Blues closely mimics the formal features of testimonial literature, capitalizing on the immediacy of the diary form, its evidentiary function, and its ability to combat dehumanization. Similarly, Adujan's Half-Blood Blues recovers Black wartime history by revisiting the jazz scene in interwar and wartime Europe, and by deploying the device of the found testimonial object. In contrast to William's diary novel, however, Half-Blood Blues allocates the first person narration not to the Black concentration camp victim, but to a problematic African-American bystander figure. 
resisting the testimonial mode in favor of a nonlinear and heavily mediated narrative structure, Adugin's postmodern novel destabilizes the realist project of historical recovery pursued by Williams. In Adugin's Half-Blood Blues, young American and European jazz musicians in interwar Berlin form a, ba a band called the Hot Time Swingers. The band's Black German trumpet player, Hieronymus or Hero, is one of the children pejoratively named Rhineland Bastards who were born to white German mothers and French colonial troops who were stationed in the occupied Rhineland after World War I. This population was perceived by the Nazis as a Jewish orchestrated threat of racial contamination to the Volksgemeinschaft or national body and was subjected to forced sterilization in the late 1930s. In the novel's replaying of this historical episode, after fleeing Germany, Hero is arrested by the Nazis in occupied Paris in 1940 and imprisoned in the Mauthausen concentration camp. Moving between the wartime years and the early 1990s, Half-Blood Blues traces the efforts of Hero's former bandmates, musicologists, and documentary filmmakers to determine what happened to him after his deportation. These attempts to solve the mystery of Hero's fate at the hands of the Nazis are emblematic of Edugen's larger literary project of investigating a lost chapter of wartime history. Simulating jazz music's circular structure and interplay of voices, Half-Blood Blues suggests that jazz's aesthetic strategies offer the writer crucial resources for such a project. Memory studies theorist Astrid Earle notes that literary narrative is distinguished by its capacity to be simultaneously memory productive and memory reflexive. In keeping with Earle's observation, the epistolary frame of Williams's novel draws attention to the circulation of Clifford's diary and to the transmission of the memories it contains to the present day reader. In Adugin's novel, literary discourse's capacity to reflect on the production of memory becomes still more apparent. Oscillating between different historical moments and circling back to key episodes, like a record that keeps turning in its grooves, the novel invites the reader to consider how memories of the past are continually reshaped according to the needs of the present. Adugin's novel repeatedly draws attention to the difficulty of producing a historical narrative of Black experience under the Nazis, even as it purports to do precisely that. For example, in a documentary screened at a Berlin festival, a scholar explains, quote, of course, it's hard to get a sense of how many Blacks actually went to the camps because so many records were destroyed. These people are lost in the dark maw of history. It's only by virtue of the recovery of a testimonial object, in this case, not a diary, but musical discs, that the memory of the Black victim endures. Much like Clifford's Blues, then Half-Blood Blues transmits a neglected memory to the reader through the device of the found object. Yet as testimonial objects, Adugin's jazz records prove more opaque than Williams's fictionalized diary. While appearing to build towards Hero's firsthand account of Mauthausen, Half-Blood Blues ultimately withholds his concentration camp testimony from the reader. Undermining the trope of testimonial authority, Adugin's approach to historical fiction resembles that of the postmodern slavery novels of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. These novels questioned the recuperative claims made by earlier realist instances of the genre. Often characterized by a fragmented temporal structure, they were less interested in recovering a historical truth than in challenging traditional historiography and exploring the legacies of the past and the present. Yet if Adugin's novel calls into question historical fiction's capacity to repair gaps in the archive, a still more profound challenge to the truth claims of realist representation is issued by my final example, a work of photo montage that is haunted by the legacy of the Holocaust and its connections to African diaspora experience. How does one visualize an invisible history? This is the central question that animated the late Scottish Ghanaian artist and writer Maud Salter's work, and in particular, her 1993 photo montage series, Circus, um, spelled in the Welsh spelling because it was commissioned by a Welsh, a Welsh institution. 
Inspired by Weimar photographer August Zander's photographs of black circus workers and influenced by the collages of German Dada artist Hannah Huch, Salter's eerie photo montages visually invoke both ethnographic uh, object photography and Nazi landscape aesthetics to unsettle assumptions about the relationship of African diaspora populations to European spaces. Read alongside its a companion poem, Blood Money, Circus is particularly striking for its refusal of portraiture and realist modes of representation. Salter's haunted Alpine scenes draw attention to Black European wartime histories, even as they simultaneously call into question the recuperative capacity of art. Salter conceived Circus as the scrapbook of a fictional Black German girl, Helga, who is also the subject of her prose poem, Blood Money, that was displayed alongside the photo montages. In Blood Money, we learn that Helga is the daughter of a Cameroonian woman named Monique, who joins a French circus troupe in 1926, and a black German man named Kwesi. After the Nazis come to power, Kwesi is imprisoned in a concentration camp while Helga is subjected to forced sterilization. Uh, and I quote from the poem, for the child of the circus, there would be no reparation for a sterilized womb family torn apart, incarcerated, in forced labor, concentration camp internment, leading for Kwesi to death with the gypsies and Jews and gays and the others. Helga's family story condenses the history of African colonial subjects immigration to Europe and the fate that they and their descendants suffered under the Nazis. The poem concludes by situating this untold wartime history as part of a series of holocausts ranging from slavery the witch trials and pogroms to the Bosnian genocide of the early 1990s. The poem's refrain is, close your eyes and imagine a German. Repeated four times, this refrain problematizes constructions of German identity and history that erase African diaspora presences. Moreover, the speaker suggests that the traumatic experiences of black people under the Nazis cannot be addressed through traditional verse form, remarking towards the end of the poem, there's no way I can make this poem rhyme. Instead, the poem's division into verse paragraphs without line breaks brings it closer to prose. At the same time, by employing poetic devices such as compression and repetition, Salter resists the linear implotment and narrative closure that characterize fiction and narrative history. Still more resistant to narrativizing the past is the Noir et Blanc series and circus which unlike its companion poem, does not offer a portrait of the black German girl, girl Helga or her mother Monique. As Deborah Cherry remarks, Helga and the spectral female protagonists of several of Salter's other works, a quote, do not cross the threshold of visibility, unquote. Instead, by pairing the photo montages with the poem, Salter indirectly implies Helga's presence as the creator of the scrapbook whose pages make up the images in circus. The source of the object photographs uh, is Frank Willett's African art from the Thames and Hudson World of Art series. In Circus, Salter excises and recontextualizes Willett's images of African objects in a resonant act of reappropriation that comments on the discourse of ethnographic photography. She mounts the black and white photographs from Willett's book on an old album of postcards featuring touristic Alpine scenes. Alluding to the Nazis encoding of the Alps as an Aryan landscape, uh, and I'm showing you here an image from 1940 of uh, Hitler's Berghof uh, Alpine retreat. Uh, so alluding to those uh, Nazi landscape aesthetics and, and uh, an Aryanization of the Alps, Salter's choice of setting suggests the capacity of the picturesque to mask violence. Helga and the Black Circus Workers photographed by August Zander haunt the pages of the scrapbook and the Alpine landscapes they display. It's become fairly commonplace to draw comparisons between African slavery and the Holocaust and the commemorative practices that surround these historical traumas. Circus asserts, however, that questions of blackness are also embedded within the problem of Holocaust memorialization. Helga's scrapbook reveals intersections between African diaspora and Holocaust memory that are not only symbolic, but also concretely historical. Circus's unpeopled, eerie Alpine landscapes are the repository of the absent presences and inherited memories 
of forgotten Black victims of Nazi persecution. As unmarked sites of memory, the haunting Alpine scenes evoke both Toni Morrison's re-memory and Marianne Hirsch's post-memory. They simultaneously suggest the repetition of the repressed trauma of slavery described by Morrison and the intergenerational transmission of Holocaust trauma theorized by Hirsch. Salter was acutely conscious of the role of photography as an instrument of human classification. In her 1989 essay, The Nature of Photography, she compiled a list of the use, uses and abuses to which photography has been put, including surveillance, immigration control, and racial categorization. Salter emphasized of slavery and many of the uses to which it was first put was that of categorizing the other. Salter's commentary on photography as an instrument of racial classification illuminates her pronounced resistance to photographic portraiture in circus. The absence of the human image in the Noir et Blanc series suggests a critique of the invisibility of Black Europeans and thematizes the extent, uh, sorry, thematize the extent to which Black culture has been represented in Europe through African artifacts obtained by colonial appropriation. If Joseph Nassi's internment portraits consolidated a human presence that was under threat, in Circus, Salter diffuses Helga's presence, instead refocusing the viewer's gaze on an iconic European landscape. The images of ethnographic objects that Salter selected for the first two montages invoke an ancestral African presence. In Noir et Blanc 1, an aerial view of the, an alpine village framed by majestic mountains and fir trees is partially obscured by an Afro wooden sculpture from Nigeria of a seated mother suckling her child. According to Willett, uh, the female figure in the sculpture represents the mother of the Afro people. The mother and child hover above the Alpine village just slightly off center, their large scale relative to the village and the mother's proud demeanor powerfully asserting an ancestral black presence at the very center of Europe. At the same time, the figure's suspension in the air above the village su suggests a certain ephemerality, a difficulty rooting in the landscape. Ancestors are still more insistently evoked in Noir et Blanc 2, which similarly positions an imposing wooden carving in the center of an alpine scene. This time, a Coda reliquary figure from Gabon or Congo used to protect the bones of family members. The viewer is confronted by the large oval face, impressive coiffure, prominent eyes and diamond shaped body of the two dimensional reliquary figure, which is seen head on suspended above the tree line that occupies the lower foreground. Behind the reliquary is a quaint Alpine village with mountains and blue sky. Viewed at eye level, the Alpine village appears empty of a human presence. In circus, the substitution of African objects for human figures and the genre of ethnographic portrait, uh, uh, photography for portraiture suggests that the history of black people in early and mid 20th century Europe is not readily retrievable. While Circus alludes to an African diaspora presence in wartime Europe, it does not attempt to reconstruct that presence, which is available in the work only through the problematic mediation of ethnographic photography. In Circus, Salter is less interested in recovering a forgotten past than in reflecting on the ways of seeing and structures of power that have prevented its apprehension. Circus articulates its critique of these mechanisms of invisibility through photomontage, a medium that has its own historical investment in the category of the exotic. Salter's assemblages juxtapose two seemingly unrelated modes of visual representation, the picturesque and ethnographic art photography that emerge in circus as mutually implicated in an imperial gaze. Bringing alpine idols and ethnographic imagery into the same visual plane, Salter exposes their common capacity for erasure and the power of landscape representation to naturalize certain identities at the expense of others. Okay, so just to conclude now, in her study of Holocaust testimony, Zoe Waxman argues that the concept of the Holocaust and the term Holocaust survivor 
project a problematic singularity that belies the heterogeneity of the experiences they designate. Employing a range of different mediums and genres, the African diaspora artists uh, and writers that I examine reinscribe Black wartime perspectives that challenge the universal identity of the Holocaust victim. Moreover, their writing and visual art attest that art, with its creative license and mnemonic staying power, has a key role to play in reorienting our understanding of the past. Yet if these artworks position themselves as producers of historical knowledge, what uh, is the nature of the knowledge that they offer us as viewers and readers? I would suggest that these works are best understood as engaged not only in a project of recovery, but also in a project of disruption to borrow Tina Camp's distinction. As I noted earlier, while internment camp portraits typically incorporate textual information identifying the figures portrayed, Joseph Nasi failed to include this kind of textual information, frustrating the, the researcher attempting to ascertain the identities of his black subjects. Instead, Nasi's internment art offers the viewer a different order of historical knowledge by communicating powerful emotional and psychological truths about the experiences of black civilian internees that are unavailable elsewhere in the archive of World War II. For their part, John Williams's and Essie Adujan's jazz novels mimic testimonial forms and exhibit testimonial objects, thereby appearing to supply the missing facts of history and to repair gaps in the archive. Yet the fictional status of Clifford's concentration camp diary means that the reader's desire to receive the black victim's testimony must finally remain unsatisfied. Adujan's novel renders the fantasy of a stable and recoverable past even more untenable by withholding the Black victim's concentration camp narrative altogether. Still more radically, Maud Salter's photo montages eschew portraiture and resist the truth claims of realism in favor of an elusive spectral engagement with the past that exposes the epistemic mechanisms of erasure. Engaged in what Jaina Brown calls acts of creative mourning, each of the artworks negotiates between a powerful desire to recover a forgotten past to make it visible and a simultaneous recognition of the impossibility of restoring a history that has been systematically erased. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, that was really uh, beautiful and moving and, and gives us so much to, uh, to think about. Um, and you're getting lots of electronic and actual clapping out there from the audience. Um, we're going to turn now to questions. I think I'm going to start the ball rolling. And then I encourage everybody, if you have questions, um, to put a note in the chat. You can simply say question and I'll call on you. Um, uh, but uh, to begin with, uh, what, what a wide ranging and uh, dynamic uh, uh, group of works you've brought together transhistorically. I, I just have to ask you more about Joseph Nassi. So I'll, I'll start there. Um, I'm so curious about how the works survived, how they uh, got out. Now they're in Washington and you've been doing research there. And also what the other internees, um, if, if there's any sense of how they responded to his artwork, how they interacted with it. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, I hope this fan noise from my computer has, didn't, wasn't too distracting. It's it just, I was hoping it would stop while I was speaking, but it, technology. Um, Joseph Nassi's artwork survived, uh, very much through his own efforts. He stayed, after he was liberated um, at the end of the war, he actually stayed in Laufen in Bavaria for a year. Uh, and, and it seems it's very difficult because there are a lot of gaps in, in our knowledge of, of, of Nasi and, and his biography and wartime story. But it seems that part of the reason why he remained in Germany for so long after the war was because he was determined to keep the collection intact and to be able to bring it back to Belgium. So apparently he was trying to 
you know, locate transportation and, 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 and get permission to, um, to return to Belgium with the artwork. So he seems to have been very determined um, to, to uh, keep it together as a collection, as a, as a testimony. Um, it's very frustrating because we don't have any, hardly any written uh, testimony from Nasi himself. So I have to you know, do quite a bit of speculating. Um, I've been meeting with his descendants um, living in various parts of the world and trying to kind of track down his story in Suriname and Belgium and, and, and the Netherlands and elsewhere. Um, so yeah, so they, so they survived and they were, um, um, he brought them back to Belgium and after he died, uh, a Belgian Jewish man named Severin Wunderman bought the collection uh, and then he eventually donated it to the uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. So that's um, the story of, of how it ended up there. Um, but it was donated to the Holocaust Museum at the moment when the museum was just opening, it was just um, uh, kind of launching itself. And I think there were some um, questions around how it fit into the museum's mandate. And I think that's part of the reason that the collection's not, not well known at all. Um, and in terms of how, uh, how uh, you, you asked about how the other interviews responded to his art, I, I, I've gathered that, um, I, you know, there's the collection is quite large, but I think there are many other pieces that are out there because he either gave or sold um, portraits to other internees uh, and they kept them. And there was one um, man I spoke with who was the son of another uh, prisoner from Milag 7. And in their family, they have, I think, nine portraits by, by Nasi. And I think they were quite treasured uh, by the other internees. Um, and we also have this relationship with another, uh, there were other artists in the internment camp as well in ELAG 7. And so we also have this interesting kind of exchange among the artists and perhaps even influence between them that I'm trying to trace as well. So um, particularly a, a, a Polish Jewish artist named Max Brandel, uh, I showed one of his caricatures, which is in the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York. Um, and very interesting, I think, to look at their work side by side and, and think about how they may have been interacting with each other. Fascinating. So I have questions. Uh, a few people are in the list already. I'll start with Jody Mason, then Jennifer, and then Naduka. So Jody, do you want to pose your question? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sarah. Can you hear me? Oops. No, I can't hear you. Shoot. Sarah, can you hear her? Yes, yes, I can hear. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'll go ahead. Sorry. Um, so I really appreciated that. Thank you, Sarah, so much. You gave me a lot to think about, and I'm. Uh, you you gave these wonderful examples of both written and visual cultures, um, uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, the the context that you're looking at. But I'm thinking about. So you talked about the influence of jazz and the jazz novel uh, in the Edgkins, um, Half Blood Blues, and and John Williams, and so on. So it got me thinking about music, and I'm just wondering, perhaps you won't talk about music in your project, but is this something musicologists have looked at, or is this something that, that you, I mean, I imagine again that, that um, as a kind of artistic response, um, music must be a, an interesting site of investigation. Absolutely, yes, and I, um, I wish I were a musicologist and could sort of, um, you know, I, I, um, it, to really explore that further, but what I have been looking at is the idea of the genre of jazz fiction and how it takes up some of the um, formal qualities of jazz as, um, as a set of strategies. And I think we can see that in Adujan's novel in, in Williams. And I have a, another set of works that deal specifically with this woman named Valeda Snow, who was uh, quite unusual for her time, a female jazz instrumentalist. At the time, women were supposed to be vocalists, but not instrumentalists. So she was quite a, a fascinating figure, um, a, a trumpeter, and she ended up um, in prison during the war. And there's, um, as with many of the figures I'm looking at, there's some controversy about what actually happened and some self-invention and some um, and some some ambiguity about that, but but there are a number of literary works inspired by her as well. So jazz music has become very central, actually, to this project, in part because many of the uh, uh, people, African diaspora people, uh, uh, expatriates who were in Europe at the time, were there because they were working as entertainers, as as performers. Um, so yeah, but in terms of the kind of the the formal qualities of jazz, what I've been interested in is. Um, things like the way that some of these literary works uh, use circularity, kind of circle back to the same um, episodes, um, kind of different riffs on the same theme, 
which I think, it, um, for example, in a Dugin's novel, uh, is a way to explore the operations of memory and traumatic memory and the kind of need to keep returning to um, certain moments and revisit them and trying to work them through. So, so I think that jazz music is a great resource for, for these writers. Um, and I, I think you were also um, alluding to, you know, the, the place of music itself in this history. And I think that, you know, there's been very interesting work done on music in the, in the camps uh, that, you know, the orchestras and so forth that were formed. Uh, and, and the idea of spiritual resistance in the camps is something that I, I think is quite useful to think about, both in terms of the production of visual art, um, of writing, and also of music, how that, you know, what might seem like um, a kind of, you know, in some ways with Nazis visual art, you think, well, that's just a sign of, you know, that he, the conditions weren't that bad, that he had access, he could produce oil paintings, you know, that kind of runs contrary to what we think of as, as a, a situation in, a, in an, a camp. But I, I've come to really think that these um, vehicles of spiritual resistance were actually really fundamental to the survival of these individuals because of the um, tremendous um, anxiety and uncertainty that confronted them and, and the um, the threat of, of deportation uh, to concentration camps and so forth. So these kind of spiritual resources from music um, were, were key. Um, and I'll just mention quickly another, I, I'd shown a picture of Arthur Briggs, another um, jazz trumpeter. He was from the Caribbean and he has a, um, a did an oral history interview that um, uh, that I've looked at and, and talks about um, music in the Saint-Denis internment camp in, in France um, and how important it was for him to be able to continue to, to perform under those circumstances. So I think it's a really, uh, really interesting area. Okay, thank you. I think Jen Evans is next. Hi, Sarah. Congratulations on this wonderful talk and then the the research is just so, so rich and so exciting. Um, and as someone who specializes in German, things I'm, I'm especially you know um, excited to to hear it um, I yeah I have uh, thousands of questions but I won't ask thousands I am um, I was curious about your thoughts on um, you know on the blind spots especially in um, and it's maybe asking you to go outside of your wheelhouse but the blind spots in in German memory culture around German colonialism, and then the structural inheritance of, of racism into the present day and how this is really something that's just so hard for Germans to account for because they've done such important work in trying to wrestle with, right, um, perpetration. And I was really struck when you showed the, um, the uh, uh, photo montages that Salter seems to be rooting their, their work in a history of of slavery and relating slavery to um, you know, German identity and, and violence. And, and there too, we see um, the history of German colonialism sort of fall away. And so I was really struck by that tension. And I wondered if you could maybe speak a little bit to that, um, whether or not this, this 19th century past is, it is somehow lost and German responsibility for a, a kind of violence that is connected to the Holocaust. But if that is just, something that falls away from, from some of this, this story as, as narrated. Well, thank you, Jen. I'm, I'm, I'm quite nervous to speak to a German historian about this, and I'm sure you later will point out all kinds of things that I may have got wrong. But um, I, yeah, no, that's a wonderful question. And I had an interesting experience last summer. I was teaching as um, a, a guest uh, professor at the University of Potsdam to a group of primarily German students uh, in a class on global Holocaust memory. And it was last summer was also a moment when, as, as you know, Germany was starting to really um, start to confront its colonial past belatedly uh, and to start to make reparations um, to some of the East African colonies. And so it was really interesting to kind of see that unfolding in Germany and then to sort of explore this question of Holocaust memory and its connections to um, to African diaspora experience with these German students. So that is very much kind of on my mind. And I, I was thinking that with Germany, but also with France, the sort of belated um, uh, uh, engagement with their colonial histories also brings to light this black history during wartime, in wartime Europe. Um, so, and it's different from, 
you know, um, because it shows again how entangled these spaces are. That you know, that it's not just that the colonials, the, the colonies are out there and Europe is over here, but in fact, you have this presence of former colonial subjects, colonial soldiers, and so forth, who who come to uh, to Germany after the war, to who settle there, um, who make lives there, and then end up getting caught up in um, in uh, in in what um, comes after 1933. So, uh, so I, I, it's the entanglement of these spaces and these histories that I think um, I'm trying to really bring to light and that these artworks really bring to light. Uh, and yeah, and, and Salter, um, she does, I mean, I think she, she talks about, you know, Toni Morrison's Rememory and, and, and I think she does, she, some of her other work addresses the history of slavery, but I think she's interested in all kinds of different moments in European history where Black um, presences and creative presences in particular become um, erased in certain ways, especially Black women creators. Um, and then that in its, um, is a, something that happens to her as well as an artist, that her own work is neglected. And it's only just recently uh, in Black British art, I think that there's a real sort of attempt, you know, in, in, um, in the British sort of um, uh, uh, context to, to recognize her. So there's this way in which both the artists that I'm looking at in many cases are also somewhat neglected and the histories that they're looking at are, are neglected. And so there's like sort of compounding of that invisibility. Um, but yeah, but just to, to go back to the, the, um, the question of the colonial and how it relates to the, um, to Holocaust history. I mean, there's been this move to, you know, on the part of Michael Rothberg and others to to try to to make these connections and to um, and to uh, to to carry carry out this kind of a colonial turn in Holocaust studies. But what I found in a lot of that work is it's often um, understood as though there's still these sort of two separate memories that are analogized, like they, or there's a parallels or there are connections where these two different disparate historical traumas are brought into conversation with each other. The work that I've been interested in is more about how they are um, um, not just um, symbolically connected, but his, connected in historical material terms and you know, unfolding in the same space. And that's why for me, for example, Elog 7, where you have these black prisoners in the same space as these Polish Jewish prisoners pretending to be Latin Americans so that they could you know, um, escape a, a worse fate. Um, that it's that you know, spatial, um, um, uh, conjunction connection of these histories that, that really fascinates me, these, these historical material intersections, not just a kind of analogy between abstract, uh, abstract analogy between different uh, disparate historical experiences. Thank you again for the question. Um, Niduka. Yeah, hi, um, thank you very much. Um, thanks, Sarah, for this presentation. I mean, uh, just listening to you, I forgot it was this scholarly presentation. It sounded like a thriller, uh, which I think is very much, um, you know, an appreciation of what you have managed to put together. This is an incredible piece of work. Um, two things that really stand for me is how, you know, these artists and their art, you know, represent, um, to echo some of the expressions that you use, you know, act, um, act of creation, and mourning, and at the same time, a project of recovery and disruption. And then here you are, you know, taking us through art, uh, literature, and music. Um, so my, my question is uh, not so much into all of this very interesting presentation that you have offered, but one of simple curiosity. How did you get to this work? What was the inspiration for this work? Thank you so much, Nduka. I really appreciate um, your response. And when you say it's like a thriller, I mean, it's also this research process has been um, like detective work. You know, it's been so difficult to trace this, these histories and stories because they're not part of the categories of knowledge that have, um, have operated in Holocaust studies and, and the way that we think about European history and so forth. So it's, I've been thinking about this as a kind of detect project of, of detection. <laughs> um, how did I come to it? You know, I think that it came out of my last book, which you know, with, which dealt with Caribbean writers' uh, um, invocations of, of Jewish history. And in the course of that research, uh, I came up. It's really through artworks, and which, in a way, I think reinforces my um, sense that art really has a key role to play here in shaping memory culture. Because it was through Essie Adujan's novel *Half Blood Blues*. 
um, and then through Nasi's, uh, Joseph Nasi's artwork that really uh, um, brought this, this history to my attention and, and just um, intrigued me and, and made me want to pursue it further. I, Nasi um, is mentioned by Paul Gilroy in sort of like one or two lines in one of his books. And I saw that mention that he was from Suriname and the Dutch Caribbean and that he had been interned in Nazi Germany. And I was, and when I saw his um, surname, I knew from my pre, prior work on the Jewish Caribbean that this was a very significant surname in Suriname, that it was a Sephardic Jewish name. So I knew there had to be a very interesting story there, again, about the entanglement of these different cultures. So, so it was really, you know, then I um, decided I, I really wanted to see his artwork. I had to kind of really persist with the Holocaust Museum to, to get them to let me see these works. Um, and, and it really kind of started there. Uh, and then as I did more and more of this detective work, I found more instances of artists who had tried to draw attention to this history. And, and often I think their work was not um, well recognized when it, when it initially appeared. Um, Adujan's novel is a bit of an exception because it's, you know, well known in the Canadian context, at least, I think. But interesting to me is that Washington Black, her more recent novel, which deals with slavery, I think that's seen as a much more expected topic for a Black writer than, than uh, World War II Europe. Um, and when Half-Blood Blues came out, there was a sense of like, okay, this is a great novel, but why is this Black Canadian writer writing about wartime Europe? There was a real, you know, and, and John Williams uh, encountered that too. He had a terrible time finding a publisher for his novel. So I think there's a sort of real failure to recognize the connections between uh, European history, European wartime history and African diaspora experience. And that has, has created real obstacles for some of these artists trying to get this, this work out. Um, so sorry, that was a long, long answer, but thank you, Duca. And I think uh, Birgit Hopfener has a question, Birgit. I think it was actually Ming who's locked yeah. in with my name. Ming? It Ming, wasn't do you me. have a question? Oh, sorry. sorry, that is me. Yes, and yeah. I do have a question. I'm sorry, I'm impersonating you. <laughs> um, I was having connection problems. Thank you, Sarah, for that wonderful talk. It was really great to see the other parts of your project, um, Maud Salter and um, Essie Adujan, um, and just to see the sort of how it's growing. Um, I actually have a question about Elog 7. Um, you were talking about the sort of entanglements and I would love to hear more about um, how this um, group was constituted, who was there, why were they put together and what those entanglements entailed. Thanks. Thank you, Ming. That's a great question. Um, Elog 7 was, uh, well, it went through a couple of different phases in terms of uh, how the camp was used by, uh, by the Nazis. But by the time Nazi, Joseph Nazi was, um, uh, was taken there, it was an internment camp for British and American citizens. But what's really fascinating for this project is that I, what I've learned in the course of this research is that, that that's really misleading, this idea of British and American citizens, because Black prisoners were, um, and colonial prisoners were categorized according to the citizenship, citizenship of their mother countries. So what you actually have in ELAG 7 are, you know, someone like a West African who's categorized as British or Latin Americans or, you know, people of actually, in fact, many different origins um, from Egypt and Syria and places like that, but are registered as, as, as American or British. And then Nazi's case is even more complicated because he actually falsified his American citizenship. He wasn't an American citizen, but pretended to be in, um, in order to, uh, to go to Europe for work and then continue to maintain that, that fiction of his American citizenship, which very likely um, uh, turned out to be very fortunate for him because as he was really, in fact, a Dutch a colonial citizen and, and probably would have fared worse if he had been imprisoned uh, under that citizenship. So, um, and then you have, uh, as I, I kind of alluded to with the artist Max Brandel, you have a group of Polish Jews who managed to obtain papers that uh, make it seem as though they are Latin American citizens. And that is a way to save themselves from, you know, from being deported um, to, to concentration camps. Uh, so there are all kinds, I mean, nobody is who they seem in this, in this campus, what I've, I sort of learned. And, 
Um, and, uh, and, and so there are many, there's a lot of um, falsifications of identity in order to survive. Um, and, and so you get this uh, mix of uh, a very heterogeneous group of, of prisoners. Um, among the black prisoners, most of them are African-American, but as I mentioned, there's a West African and then there's a Nazi from, from the Caribbean. I think there's a Cuban as well. Um, so it, I, I really would like to get further into kind of understanding who, it's, who all these figures are. Uh, and, uh, but, but it's interesting to think if, if that's the case at ELAG 7, to what extent is that the case at other camps as well? Um, there was a study by a group of Austrian researchers about Mauthausen, and they found, I think, something like 156 uh, people of African uh, origin uh, in, in that camp. But nobody knows what the real numbers uh, of, of Black prisoners in the camp system was because the Nazis did not have a designated category for Black prisoners. And again, because they were categorized according to their colonial citizenship, so they would be registered as French or Dutch or whatever. So it, it's a very, it's the historians have, um, it's very difficult for them to, to trace this history and to reconstruct it. So there's a real problem in the archive in terms of the fragmentation of this, um, of this record. Uh, and, can, and that, can I just ask you to um, comment on whether or not they were particularly artistic? Was it, was it sort of categorized as being a site for artistic production? The ELAG the 7 or, or, or the black prisoners or? Um, I think, I don't, I don't think so. I think that many of the internment camps and the concentration camps, there's a huge amount of art produced, even in the concentration camps where the circumstances are so much more difficult. I mean, they're not producing oil paintings, but they would find scraps of whatever they could. Um, and, 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 and in those cases, often, you know, producing art was really a very risky undertaking. So I think it shows kind of going back to Joni Mason's question, it shows how important, important the production of art was to these prisoners uh, in their, um, to sustain themselves, to give themselves some hope. And also to, as I kind of mentioned with Nasi, a, a way of um, regaining some sense of control or agency in this context of disempowerment. Uh, so, so there's a lot of, um, um, you know, a, a lot of art produced in all of the camps, but a lot of it, of course, doesn't survive. Uh, so, um, so I, I see Nazi's uh, artwork as very much part of this, you know, art production, but also as quite unique in terms of who he's depicting. Okay, thank you. Um, Catherine, I think you had a question. I, th I think Paul Taberge was ahead of me. Am I... Uh, why don't you go ahead, Catherine? Okay. I've got you first. Okay. All right. Um, anyway, what I, Sarah, thank you so much for this talk, which was so clear and just so wonderful to hear about all these different aspects of your research. So thank you so much for this. Um, and you've partly answered the question just in, in your answer to Ming. But so I was wondering about how common it was to, to produce art in the camps. But I also wonder, um, and obviously you can make art with a lot of different kinds of materials, but how, like, I'm just wondering about how he got his hands on oil paints and 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 yeah. and ink and all these sorts of things. Like, how, like, just how did that happen? And and how did uh, like was that a common thing to have access to things like art materials? Yeah, I know it seems very counterintuitive, doesn't it? Um, that he had he would, it was able to produce so much work, and again, you know, oil paintings, which mm -hmm. require a lot of time and equipment. Um, he it was uh, the the Geneva Convention. Um, that, that allowed the prisoners to access to not only art materials, but they had a library in the Elag 7, they had sports equipment, um, they had a, a considerable, um, and, and it was the International YMCA that brought in these materials uh, and musical instruments as well. Um, so, so that was, again, a, a big difference between um, being in, in an internment camp governed by the Geneva Convention where the, mm. I mean, I'm not sure that the Geneva Convention was always respected as much as it was at ELAG 7. They seem to have been somewhat fortunate in that way, but, um, but that, was, that was the reason that he had access to those, to those things. And they taught each other, you know, they taught, um, he gave art lessons in the camp and it was a way, again, to, I think, to sustain themselves. Um, in this in these circumstances so thank you welcome 
um, Halter Bears. Hi, uh, th this was a fascinating talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, and it's, it's kind of really interesting that, that art should play this role in this fragmentary history and then to kind of try and flesh it out in the, in the in fiction. Um, I just I had a couple of comments as more than questions, I think. Um, I was going to mention the musical instruments that I know of some instances where musicians were allowed to keep their instruments. There's a famous work by Olivier Messiaen called The Quartet for the End of Time that was composed in a concentration camp. And he had a group of musicians that had their instruments. I think the cellist had to substitute a wire for a string when it broke at one point. They didn't have everything they needed. But they, he, he was allowed to have manuscript paper the musicians rehearsed and they performed it in the concentration camp at like at the top of a hill somewhere and it was amplified so that all the prisoners could hear it so it was premiered in in the camp so there there, there are a few famous examples of, of music coming from the camps that have become part of the standard repertoire but with jazz in particular it's kind of really interesting because the history of jazz is tied up so much with the circulation of recordings not meant not manuscripts not you know written mu music um, and there's such a parallel history of jazz that takes place in Europe because that's where a lot of musicians went, where jazz was affirmed as an art form. Uh, not in the, and what's one of the things that's kind of poignant in your account um, or in the fiction, uh, fictionalizing of this jazz relationship, as the writer riffs on the riffs that come from the music, there's also this, this kind of sense of this kind of like special status that black people had in Europe that would force them into making decisions like, do I stay here and take all the risks that this would entail rather than go back to America and where I know what I'm, I'm going to be, you know, in for there. Um, so there was, it, it just really struck me that in this parallel history of jazz, that this, it should come to something like that, that, that within black culture, and, and having their own history with even within this history being effaced all the time, that th those were the kinds of choices that were forced on people. So it's, 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 it's a hugely poignant account. And I think there's other stories like the story of jazz in America and jazz in Europe that, that's kind of like all operating in the background of this. Yeah. So there's not a question there, but it's no, just no. A, <laughs> Well, th thank you so much, Paul. No, this is, I mean, I have been trying to delve into the history of jazz because it's just become so significant for what I've been looking at, because, partly because so many of these figures were, were jazz musicians and were looking for, um, you know, great, um, trying to get away from Jim Crow in yeah. the U.S. And so that's part of why some of them don't return to the U.S. when, uh, when they see that the war is going to break out. Some of them do, but some of them remain in Europe uh, you know, kind of hoping, I think, that they won't, it won't really um, impact them, and then, and then it does. Um, but, but the, it gives you a sense, I think, of how much they wanted to get away from circumstances at home, that they would yeah. make that decision. And so really, but, really but I think there was also this affirmation, there was a the sense that, you know, they were valued as musicians yeah. in, Europe, yeah. in Europe in a way that they were not in America. Yeah, and as Black people, Right, because yeah. they they had often um, received much better treatment, uh, bef you know, but at least before the war in Europe than they had at home. So, and and particularly for, but I mean, here you get into differences between like Black German experience and African American experience, and that's something that the novelists look at as well. Um, mm -hmm. That there are certain privileges with America, and then you, you see many um, Black Europeans who pretend to be African Americans because there's a kind of um, uh, you know, um, cultural capital attached to that, and the, and they receive better um, uh, treatment as a result. So that, but that dilemma of whether to stay or not uh, is is really key, I think, for these figures and these sort of decisive moments where they have to decide. But then af also after their, some of the Elag Seven uh, jazz musicians are are repatriated to the United States, they're released, and they're interviewed by the Af African American press when they get back to the states, and they and many of them say. They want to go back to Europe as soon as they can. They don't want to be back in the U.S. Europe is where they've made their homes, and they, you know, they, they, they. Um, there's no kind of patriotic feeling even during wartime for this um, return to the U.S. Um, but also, I just have to mention that you know, jazz under the Nazis, of course, has this very um, problematic status, right? Sure. Um, and so that, and I was just thinking as you were talking about music um, produced, you know. Uh, composed and performed in the camps. Arthur Briggs, this uh, jazz trumpeter I mentioned before, 
um, when he uh, is in prison in Saint Denis, he's in, put in an orchestra. In fact, he gets to, he's able to transfer to Saint Denis because they need him for the orchestra there. But he doesn't perform jazz music in the camp, which is you know right not seen. The Nazis had a very negative view of jazz. Um, but apparently, he as, in their performances he would do this sort of little move at the end as a kind of shout out of solidarity of some kind to the other prisoners, sort of covertly, but communicating with them um, through through the music. So I think it was a very, very um, powerful um, tool for them to kind of maintain a sense of, of hope um, under those circumstances. So, but thank you so much for yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to hear more of this research. I, I think that's the consensus uh, from everyone. This has been just a really rich discussion, a wonderful lecture. Um, I think we've come to the end of the discussion, but I don't think we really have because there'll be many discussions with Sarah and we're all going to want to read this uh, wonderful work on memory studies, art production and, and history. Um, so thank you. Please join me in warmly thanking Sarah Castile for a wonderful lecture and discussion today. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And the lecture is recorded. So um, if you know of anyone who wasn't able to come, we'll, we'll be posting it.